on, perfect. Uh, a topic uh, from Jennifer uh, Shioile. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And if I'm not, then uh, Jennifer can have my head. Uh, the name of the topic for today is Loving Your Player Means Letting Go of the Difficulty Discussion. Uh, I just want to like give a quick bio on Jennifer. Uh, she's a multi-award-winning game designer, most known for the uh, Earthlight franchise. Uh, and she received Game of the Year Award at the Australian Game Developers uh, event in 2017 uh, in collaboration with uh, NASA's uh, Hybrid Reality Lab. So, yes, she has worked with NASA. And parts of her work are used to develop training for astronauts. Uh, in 2017 and 2018, uh, she made MCV's, uh, sorry, MCV's uh, Pacific's 30 Under 30 list. Uh, for her passion and public appearances on game design, UX, diversity in games, and educating audiences on game development processes. Her work on hidden game design has been published by major outlets uh, such as Polygon, Rolling Stone Magazine, and Variety. Uh, up until recently, though, uh, Jennifer has worked as a lead game designer uh, on an unannounced third-person action game at Arena. Now she's no longer there right now. Uh, but right now, uh, she was at that time heading up the design for a procedurally generated uh, a gen level system. Uh, so guys, uh, without further ado, I am going to call Jennifer on the stage. Clacky, clacky keyboard. Cool. Honored to have her. Yes, uh, Kailash, absolutely. She's a fantastic person. And there she is. Guys, Hi. Uh, <laughs> please give a big round of applause in the chat for Jennifer. Oh, Jevin is also there. Awesome. I, I did my job, boss. Lovely. So. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Yeah. Do I have to oh. share my screen again, I guess? <laughs> uh, uh, yes. Get off uh, the panel. And yes, please share your screen. Hold on. Can you see this? Um, yes. Can you hear me yes, still? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Perfect. Everything's Excellent. working. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Um, are we done? Are we, are we ready to go? <laughs> Great. So welcome to Loving Your Player Means Letting Go of the Difficulty Discussion. Uh, it's really awesome to be here. I am always excited when I get to give a talk like this because difficulty discussions are kind of close to my heart. So um, I'm, I'm really excited to be here and to talk to all of you about this topic. I'm super excited to have questions and discussion afterwards. So um, I know you have a Q&A tab, so please hold your questions until then. I would like to go through the presentation and then in the end we can discuss. I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions, uh, not just questions. So, you know, let's make this an open forum kind of thing. Okay, so um, if you have not met me before, my name is Jennifer Scheierle. I am a German game developer currently living in the US, but moving to Canada, and it's a whole thing. Um, up until recently, I was a lead game designer at ArenaNet, um, makers of Guild Wars. <laughs> I Please don't ask me anything about Guild Wars. I did not work on Guild Wars. I don't know anything about Guild Wars. Uh, my next gig is still to be announced, so I apologize for not being able to tell you what I'm going to be doing next, but it's... The announcement is imminent, so um, I'm, I'm just in the middle of moving and all that stuff. Uh, if you have any further questions beyond this talk and beyond this panel, beyond our discussion, you can tweet at me under at um, I'm always happy to connect and talk to people there. So I'll also be sharing my uh, my email address in the at the very end of the um, of the presentation, so you can also email me there. All right, so let's dive into the actual topic. I think uh, this is going to be a very interesting and steep talk because I have kind of a goal with giving talks about difficulty and writing about difficulty. I have written for Polygon about the same topic a couple of times, and uh, I want to continue to do that because I kind of want to fundamentally change the way we discuss and think about difficulty in this industry. So I believe that culturally we have this gaping disconnect in how game designers speak about the topic versus our player base and sometimes even the press. And I feel like it has become this widespread thing to call every perceived hard to learn, hard to master game, the dark souls of his genre, which is, you know, just a shorthand for calling a game's difficult, which I think is not particularly useful. 
the entire sentiment is kind of detrimental to gaming culture as a whole and you know pushes us in this direction of hardcore versus softcore and i think it's exclusionary towards accessibility discussions and frankly is also kind of incorrect right i think it completely misses the point of both souls like games and what they are about and how they function and what they are about getting across while also breeding a culture of elitism around what we believe are hardcore games. So I personally believe that we shouldn't talk about hardcore versus softcore games at all, but instead think about these games as different gameplay flavors and give people more um, inclusionary language about talking about uh, what they like as their personal challenges when playing games. So I don't know if this is going to catch on, but in my writings about this topic, I have called these things gameplay flavors instead. Um, maybe this is going to stick, maybe it isn't, but this is how I am referring to it whenever I design within teams and within games. So yeah, for many years, games have employed difficulty settings for players. You know, you know, the story mode is the newest one, and easy, medium, hardcore, and then there's like hardcore plus, and you know, a million other things that you can think of. Uh, and I think. In my opinion, that is an outdated approach to difficulty settings. I think it's kind of archaic uh, for multiple reasons. I think, A, it is uh, often quite unpredictable for players what they're getting. So, you know, let's say I play a new game and I want to have a fairly cruisy experience and I don't want to be super challenged. So I put on a dif the difficulty setting easy, but I don't really know what I'm getting out of that. It just says that it will somewhat be easier. But I don't know what that means. Does that mean enemies have fewer health? Does it mean I'm stronger? Does that mean um, when I put up the difficulty setting to medium or hard, enemies are going to become in it, uh, become bullet sponges? Or, you know, I have very little to go off as a player when I choose a difficulty setting that player, um, that, sorry, that game developers have chosen for me. I find it difficult as a developer, too, to make generic guesses on what people find difficult. Um, that's not quite how difficult it works. Like we, we perceive different things as difficult and we enjoy different challenges as humans. So trying to predict what an easy setting looks like for a variety of people seems uh, like an uh, uncomfortable approach for any developer, right? So the difficulty settings always only suit a small group of people accurately because we can't predict it for all of our audiences. It also perpetuates the idea that playing on easy is somewhat inferior to playing on medium or hard or hardcore or whatever it is. There is this like somewhat classist elitist approach to how we name these difficulty modes. So ultimately, I believe that we can do better, um, both culturally as well as for player agency. I think there are better approaches to this, and I would like to bring this discussion into the modern games industry times. Um, and because I've been talking about Dark Souls a lot, I feel like we have to discuss the Dark Souls formula and debunk some ideas around difficulties of the Dark Souls games a little bit for us to have a good discussion about it. So that's what we're going to do. Um, so last year, while I was working at ArenaNet, I had a colleague there. Uh, his name is Byron. Sorry, they, uh, they changed their pronouns. Their name is Byron. And uh, we had these game design lunch sessions with a... Um, within the, the company and we would, you know, have lunch together and discuss games and discuss some core elements of it. And one of those games were the Dark Souls games. So um, we wanted to put up a whiteboard scribble, basically, of what we think the Dark Souls formula is and why it works so uniquely compared to other games. And here's the diagram that we ultimately came up with to explain, explain our thought process. So in our opinion, Dark Souls is not necessarily a harder game, but our perception of how we learn within the game, within Dark Souls games or Souls-like games, is not culturally geared towards learning while doing. So I feel like um, Dark Souls games require you to learn what you need to do and how to succeed in the game while you're doing it. And that is culturally not something we enjoy um, as people, you know, culturally, we enjoy learning in a safe environment where it's easy to fail and there are very few consequences for failing. Um, and we perceive learning as we are doing things as kind of threatening and anxiety inducing, which is why Souls games are perceived as being more anxiety inducing and scary and difficult if you want. So Dark Souls specifically requires us to learn like this, learning patterns as we play and then adapting on a second, third, 
forth whatever how many tries you need to defeat an enemy. So at its core, we believe that the Dark Souls games and the flavor of those games is a progression system. Sorry if there's a cat in the background, that's going to happen. <laughs> um, so I, I think that it's really important to make a distinguish, uh, distinguishing thought about that Dark Souls games are a different kind of progression instead of believing that they're harder or easier than other games. Like I think it's not an accurate way of thinking about the way it works. So ultimately, to explain the diagram, I believe Dark Souls is about trust. It's a trust between uh, the player and the developer is this contract of an equal power dynamic. Um, the Dark Souls game requires you to understand that if you lose or if you mess up or if you die, it is your fault. And the developer-player contract is, I know how to overcome the challenge. So I, as a developer, make a pact with you as a player in a Dark Souls game that I will always make sure that you know why you have lost. And therefore, you know that it's your fault that you've lost and how to improve from there. So the way it achieves that is by doing extreme signposting. So, you know, every big attack that could kill you is like extremely animated, extremely big, extremely clear to see what is happening. The rule set is very clear and it's clearly communicated and it gives you very clear tools on how to overcome challenges. I think that is the Dark Souls formula of player trust. And uh, I want you to keep that in mind, the trust idea when thinking about difficulty uh, going forward in this in this talk. Um, I think it's also important that we need to recognize that there are many, many different ways to perceive difficulty as humans and as people in the first place. And that's why we need to stop calling it that because it's just inaccurate, right? So let's, let's think about a couple of different challenges that people perceive when we think about difficult games. These are only some examples um, that people would go over when thinking about challenge and difficulty. Um, most people would, you know, talk about control dexterity, for example. So that's related to how complex the control scheme is, uh, usually more closely related to the to a gamepad than mouse and keyboard because people find that diff more difficult to learn it. It's not as, you know, intuitive to us. So, for example, does the game require modifier buttons to access some controls beyond the regular button set? Things like that. There's a lot of di control dexterity that people perceive as very difficult. Um, some people find it very difficult to make emotional decisions. Uh, you know, to sell, say, Telltale games where they need to choose between one person or the other, saving one person or the other. Um, having to make conflicting choices with severe in-game consequences. Some people find that very anxiety-inducing. We don't think about this as difficult, but some people find that very anxiety-inducing, and we should include these things in thinking about challenge, right? Then there's people who find pattern recognition and memorization very difficult. So it requires people to memorize patterns such as enemy attacks, vulnerabilities, level layouts, sequences, things like that. Hardcore fighting games with combo lists is one of those examples. Some people find pattern recognition and memorization very hard. Um, and then there's progression systems, you know, ready to help players learn skills within a game, whether progression is loaded with information all at once or it gives you players it gives players safe spaces with few consequences to learn. You know, um, as an example would be the, the Zelda games are very strict in how they do progression and teach you new skills throughout the games, right? There's always, usually, depending on which Zelda games you like, <laughs> um, if you go into a dungeon, you usually get some new skill or some new weapon or some new ability that you then need to use, and there's always, like, you know, a mini boss that teaches you how to use it, and then you need to apply those skills again at the end boss, and things like that. It's a very strict way of doing progression systems in, in Zelda games um, compared to, let's say, Dark Souls. So the entire point of of this is we want to think about challenge from multiple angles and with multiple flavors in mind. Not everyone thinks about difficulty the same way as others. Some people perceive challenge from all kinds of different angles, and it's not only about uh, Dark Souls-like um, setups, right? Okay, so um, it's really difficult to not talk about difficulty without bringing up Celeste. If you haven't played Celeste, I highly recommend looking into it. Um, it's one game that has embraced more a more modern approach to difficulty settings. Uh, again, Celeste. Celeste allows players to incrementally change the way they would like to engage with the game, arguably in a way that relates to difficulty. <laughs> Some people would say it's more accessibility, but uh, to me, those things are, are related, right? So what I find fascinating about this kind of approach is that I think it's kind of 
ego-less design, you know, believing that making difficulty settings that are player focused won't take away from the core experience, for example. And I believe that is the right way of going about making difficulty settings in the first place, not assuming what your audience needs to enjoy playing your game and letting them mix and match settings instead. Instead of giving the player an easy, medium, hard um, difficulty setting, the game just lets you adjust game speed or the stamina or literally makes you inv invincible if you want to be and just that's a very egoless approach to 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 difficulty right it doesn't get hung up on having to force the player through difficulty settings to believe that the game is still going to be enjoyable i think that is a really great way of thinking about the player when thinking about difficulty and mix and matching uh, assist assist modes or mix and matching settings is such a wonderful modern approach to difficulty settings and i would love for us to move more into that direction now, <laughs> um, I have an argument for why I believe we're already doing some of this. Whenever I talk about difficulty like this and whenever I talk about how we should approach it, people are a little outraged because, you know, that's a, somehow outrageous to suggest that we should do it this way. But I believe we're already designing this way. We're just not calling it that. And I want to illustrate why I believe game designers already think about difficulty in designing for humans in a more accessible way. I would like to talk about the topic of hidden game design because these examples will illustrate why that is already part of our thinking process. Um, if you know me, you know I've been very passionate about this topic for a very long time. I've given hidden game design talks since 2017 <laughs> when it came up first. Um, Hidden game design is really uh, a, all about the little helpers that we implement in our game systems that support players towards a more enjoyable experience or to force a reaction out of them that we want or to emotionally engage them or make um, the flow of a game better, things like that. The recognition of how we're designing already for flaws and humans might have, um, when playing games, and lifting them up through the experience instead is something we already do. I believe that the same principles can be applied to difficulty in the end. So uh, the hidden design discussion started in 2017 when I was writing a talk for New Zealand GDC. <laughs> and I asked them um, on Twitter, I asked other game developers about if they could share hidden mechanics that they have implemented in... <laughs> uh, in their games to help players understand um, certain aspects of the game better or force a reaction out of them or, you know, emotionally engage them and things like that. So I'm going to go over some examples to illustrate that we're already doing these things and helping players in subtle ways to make the, make games more enjoyable. Okay. So, um, this talk is kind of structured in several categories that relate to design goals, such as emotional engagement, crafting tension and others. And I will provide some context for the background of these techniques first. And then we're going to go in-depth into in-depth examples given to me by certain developers. I will credit them at the top of the screen uh, to make sure that they are credited, the people who helped me for this talk. Um, I want to start with some warm-ups, <laughs> mechanics that some of you might already know because you've seen them before and the term is more widely known. Um, so I'm going to brush over them a little bit before going into more in-depth examples. Okay, probably the most infamous game mechanic, uh, the most infamous hidden game design, which is why I won't get into too much detail about it, but it's a great way to jump into the topic, is rubber banding. Um, rubber banding exists in a lot of racing games, but Mario Kart probably is the game that coined it the most. Uh, essentially, it's a technique which allows for AI players in the game to catch up on you, no matter how far ahead you are, to create tension and conflict in the game. The practice has been criticized a lot, many, many times by player communities, because it has the chance to lead to unbeatable AI in some players, in some games, sorry. However, the background of this mechanic is to have players race in packs, because the game is about conflict and fighting and using power-ups, right? especially in Mario Kart. Uh, it allows for more interesting conflict situations, many changes in ranking, and effective use of your power-ups. So in the specific example of Mario Kart, many mechanics serve the purpose of keeping the pack together, because you know, if we face it, 
telling far behind is not fun, but also equally being far ahead in a lead isn't very fun either, as you don't get to use any of your power-ups and any of your abilities. So it kind of wants to force you to knuckle down and uh, really challenge you throughout the game. So in Mario Kart, apart from the adjustments of speed, depending on um, where the player is in the rankings, it gives you uh, a higher chance of more powerful items when you're further behind, and it removes items such as the blue honing shell, for example, in the list of items you can get when you're in position one, two, or three. This kind of balancing allows for more interesting plays that keep you on the edge of your seat and never allow for you to feel entirely safe, requiring you to do your best throughout the entire race which is why the uh, mechanics implemented that way. Okay, um, the Raymond franchise introduces something, or introduces, I think it's been around for longer, but it's, it's used a lot in the Raymond franchise, a hidden game design mechanic called Coyote Time. Coyote Time um, is called Coyote Time because of Wiley Kuro Coyote from the, you know, the, uh, the comic where it basically means that you still have a valid jump floating in the air after you've already fallen off a ledge, uh, where you can still jump and the jump, is, the jump button is still valid. Um, it's used largely in, in platforming games, especially when they're fast paced, such as a Rayman franchise. So uh, anything that is flow based implements this feature to make jumps feel more fair to players and allow for flaws in the way humans judge distance and visual overload from fast moving vir virtual environments on a screen. So you can see in the example here uh, how when Raymond is like already off the ledge a little bit, you can still jump. Uh, here it's like very obvious. There's like a good like half second where you can still make the jump after Raymond has fallen off the ledge. <laughs> okay. So this was the introduction to, to hidden game design. Let's talk a little bit more about um, more in-depth examples. Um, this is maybe my favorite category because I feel like it's what, that's what's at the heart of what hidden game design is about. And I've built this category on the premise of designing for the flawed human psyche, which is something we all need to consider when making games. Essentially, this category shows examples of when game designers had to implement mechanics to, for example, um, help players feel less cheated, excuse me, not get jumped unfairly, or to build multiplayer communities. These techniques and many more exist this way because we, when we play games, we lack a whole lot of the senses that we usually have when you know running around in a regular environment. Uh, let's say if you play a first person game, we have to implement some like small helping hands to make up for the fact that you don't have you know as much vision as you do in your real uh, world running around. You don't have access to the senses that you have. You don't have hear the same way you do. So we're trying to make up for some of that lack of senses by implementing some mechanics that will help you overcome that when playing on the screen. Um, I think we employ these to cater to how humans function and especially find ways to support them when they struggle, uh, such as with chance, perception, or math. That is like, and the number one thing of how we have to uh, adjust for the human psyche. So for example, when we give players a true 50% chance of a roll, uh, most players expect to win a roll every second time, despite that's not how math works, right? Like a 50% chance is not really something where you can expect to win after you've lost one roll, right? Like 50% chance is, is much lower than that and you can lose 10 times in a row and that's perfectly within that. So usually games that do a 50% chance something, roll for something, then taper out the chance to be higher to make up for the human perception of what a 50% chance is really like. That is super common. Anyways, so let's jump into this. Um, first example is Bioshock. Uh, the person giving me this example was Ken Levine, a creative lead, I'm sure you know him. Bioshock, uh, despite having many combat elements, had an overarching goal of telling a complex and rich narrative, uh, if you know the game. So the focus for the designers was to favor that over combat difficulties, which is why they implemented a hidden game mechanic that has been implemented in other games in similar forms ever since. The first shot of every enemy attacker in this game always misses you. You can see it many, many times in this example. Just watch the video. <laughs> The thinking behind this mechanic was to build challenge in combat situations that doesn't feel unfair and gives players a chance to overcome these challenges. 
An AI that jumps you out of nowhere with no way for you to detect them early enough to counter their attack is not fun. Being outwitted by an AI isn't fun. Um, building an AI that is overwhelming and, you know, really easy is really easy. So I can make an AI, an AI that can shoot you with 100% accuracy from the other end of the map. And that is not an interesting AI, right? Like we need to build AI that reacts fluidly to the player and makes sure that we have a chance to overcome the challenge. So building challenging and interesting AI is complex and the messaging for the player while encountering them should be about feeling like they lost because they failed, not because they didn't get a chance to counter. In Bioshock, the first missing shot ref therefore acts as like a warning shot for players to react. So it's not taking away from difficulty, it's just giving a chance for players to understand what the next challenge is like and what to, to fight next. Uh, on top of that mechanic, a single shot can't kill you in Bioshock and instead puts you on 1% health, regenerating up to 20% uh, to give you a chance to take a break from combat, regain your posture to analyze the situation, for example. And the goal of, of that is to create intense situations that players can survive. Um, in this talk and in you know many other games, you will see other games employing similar mechanics to this one, like health, safe, safety bells are completely common, and we'll talk about them more. Okay, next example, Hellblade Cinema Sacrifice, one of my favorite games. It's a really, really great game if you haven't played it. Um, the example was given to me by Stefano Prosperi. He was a game designer on the game. Um, so I would like to cover a little bit of Hellblade's AI and combat system for fairness today. Despite Hellblade being a well of beautiful hidden game mechanics that it, you know, it does so many things really, really well. Um, this one is made to keep you on the edge of your seat and to like tell Senua's story through its gameplay mechanics. So it's a third person game. Uh, some hidden design is used to ensure players have a reasonable chance against enemies. But overall, one of the major design goals for the game was to make Senua struggle because it's a game about struggle. So even on easy, the game is quite challenging as an experience, um, but there are some tricks that the game employs to make it easier for you. So as we're watching this video, uh, I hope you can see this mechanic uh, where the enemy currently targeted by the player, by Senua, is the only one that can terminate an attack early, cutting the animation short to ensure it can react more dynamically to the player. Other characters that you, or enemies that you're not targeting cannot do this. So this means that the game avoids the current target being stuck in a long animation cycle, for example, from a heavy attack sequence, to ensure the player is not stuck watching a long animation to be played out and instead have the enemy be more in tune with the player's actions and be more fluid in its combat. All right, um, I'm sorry for the sc screenshot not being super great, but you know, debug footage is sometimes a little awkward. <laughs> Uh, on top of that, enemies that are outside of the player's sight, meaning off screen, get a timer attached to them, which prevents them from attacking for a certain amount of time. So it's a little hard to see on the screenshot, um, but the free floating camera shows that the two enemies on the left side that are behind Senua, with the red timers above them, have fallen into this hidden mechanic because they are currently off screen for the player. So an early iteration of this mechanic included having enemies try to get back into the player's field of view, essentially into a cone in front of the player. But designers decided that it wasn't challenging enough to suit the design goal of Senua struggling. So instead, they made enemies that are not in view kind of wait for a certain amount of time. So you had time to fight one enemy before you had to take care of the others. I really also wanted to show you this one. Um, this is Hellblade's ticketing system for how the AI coordinator works. So enemy attacks in Hellblade are coordinated via a backend ticket system, as seen as in the example here. So in order to be allowed to attack, enemies need to be assigned a ticket by the AI coordinator. So tickets are limited and the requests for tickets are sorted according to specific rules. I don't have the exact full rule set for that, but you can get the idea from just looking at the screen. So attacks are categorized in melee, block, breakout, and melee special and taunt, and with all the tickets listed underneath. Green are the available tickets, light blue are assigned tickets, and dark blue are claimed, and red means the ticket for this attack is currently locked. Uh, a ticket system like this is really smart because it basically means um, that it makes enemy patterns for the player to recognize because they are true across all enemy types, while at the same time making enemies behave differently according to what tickets are available. 
So it creates this unique combat dynamic for players that requires them to recognize patterns on the spot while never knowing which enemy will, enemy will perform them. So it makes for a more intuitive, like gut-based combat experience if you are looking for something like that. I think it's awesome. Um, I, I really enjoy playing it. So highly recommend this game. OK, so let's talk about this category. I only have one example in the Favoring Human Connection category, but I really wanted to make sure I talk a little bit about this, um, largely because I'm hoping we get a lot more modern pioneers in this field and like, doing more things towards human connection uh, when we make games. We're, we're still a little bit at the cusp of what that means. So I only have one example in this category. It's basically all about that we're trying to give a game very realistic conditions to give room for how humans engage emotionally with characters, environments, and an overall narrative. So obviously, it's going to be about Firewatch. <laughs> um, Jane, Jane lives in Seattle. She's awesome. She was the art lead on, on this game, and uh, she gave me this example. So in Firewatch, um, the hidden game mechanic is to make dialogues the for the player encounters feel more real, interactions have more realistic consequences. So games like Firewatch have long implemented a dialogue timer for choosing responses as one of their core mechanics. And the implementation of it to, is to ensure players understand that the world is not really arbitrarily waiting for their input, right? But that the world functions without them and not reacting to it has consequences. So giving the player endless amounts of time where the world waits on them and their responses prevents us from seeing virtual characters as independent beings. Responding to a person in our everyday lives, like in the real world, is an expected social rule, and not responding would have real tangible consequences in the real world. So in Firewatch, the same thing is the case. Ignoring a character or letting a conversation tra trail off will be reacted to by NPC characters and have an impact on how they handle a situation. So the game does not always have automatically good or bad repercussions for choosing to stay silent, but making the time of an NPC matter makes them feel like they matter in the game world. So there's an example where on day two, Delilah, the other person that you're speaking to in the game uh, via like a, a, a walkie talkie, has a confronting conversation with the main character about his wife, Julia, and staying silent in some of those situations, letting the conversation trail out will result in Delilah to be more forthcoming. Another example are conversations that you may find to be too long for some players in testing, giving players the option to stay silent or give very short answers like you would do in real life when you don't want to have a specific conversation, allows for players to opt out or in to get let lengthy conversations not fully play out. So you can use that to create player agency as well. All right, category four, uh, crafting tension. Um, Tension and flow are a really fixed part of game design pretty much across all genres. And many aspects feed into the flow and tension of your game, such as narrative arcs or difficulty curves and more. And one of the most difficult areas of keeping control over tension in your game is combat, uh, mainly because it has to cater to many different types of players with many different skill sets and perception of difficulty and things like that. So I will go into some examples specifically for flow later. And these uh, examples in this category are more about crafting combat tension. OK, so let's talk about Assassin's Creed health mechanics. Um, this was given to me by Ashraf Ismail, who was the game director on several Assassin's Creed games, most notably uh, lately on Valhalla. So uh, the original example, when I started this Twitter thread to talk about hidden game design, started with an Assassin's Creed example. Uh, the series has been through several alterations of this health mechanic, and uh, I, I haven't played Valhalla yet, so I don't know what this new game is doing. But the, the gist of it is that uh, over the years, with the one shot on the screen, including a similar mechanic as previously mentioned in Bioshock, where instead of one hit killing blows, the animus in the game glitches out and granting you a couple of seconds to recover from it instead of killing you off instantly. So it has certain mechanics that will prevent you from dying immediately or giving you a better flow throughout a combat encounter to react to. So when I spoke to Ashraf Ismail, um, I'd like to detail how the latest iteration of the health mechanic works in, in his games. Um, the player's life bar in AC games is usually broken up in several chunks of health portions. In Origins, that was three sections. 
when players receive damage in combat and are on less than 100% health and have not taken more damage for a couple of seconds, the current health section they are in regenerates. Players can't regenerate beyond the block you are currently in while you're in combat. So if players are above the 66% health, which means two full blocks, and still in the third, taking a bl big blow still leaves players with at least 7% health, giving them a chance to recover from the situation. Once you drop below the 66% threshold, they can be one-shotted by enemies. To help players out in a situation like this, the time it takes to regenerate in the last block is increased, though. The idea is to have people stuck in a tense situation, but rig the system in their favor to give them a chance and allowing for more situations where players feel like they escape with the skin of their teeth. The entire idea of all of these mechanics, which are implemented pretty much across the board in third-person games, are to make players lose health faster, faster at the beginning of the fight and then give them more underlying mechanics that help you out at the end of the fight to make you feel like you just got away, yeah, like you just made it out. You're so good that you just made it out of this fight and you didn't die, even though it looked like you might. That is the entire idea of making and crafting tension within combat scenarios like that. Um, so the game doesn't feature any po potion or consumable mechanics, so the regeneration system is a way to encourage people to play combat in a tactical manner, uh, take breaks and use the environment to, to their advantage, really. Uh, okay, that's it for Assassin's Creed. Let's talk about Bioshock again, because, of course. <laughs> so this one was brought to me by Paul Helquist, who was a writer on Bioshock. Um, one of the design goals of Bioshock was to have players on what they called the ragged edge. It was essentially the idea of keeping the tension and feeling of System Shock 2 at the time while making the focus to be more on narrative and therefore broaden the audience by implementing mechanics that allows for different skill levels to play the challenging game. So alongside the ragged edge, design pillar designers wanted for players to feel hungry, um, which leads to implementation of an auto-balancing system for, uh, for resources. So Bioshock basically tries to make players of all skill levels constantly feel hungry, hungry for key resources, such as ammo or health. And it's next to impossible to pick the right numbers for balancing a system like that for every single, single person playing the game. So they decided to build a dynamic system to achieve this instead. So what they did was they involved a system that tracked the player's overall power at all times and increased the potential drop rate for resources that they needed when they were low and removed resources that the game wanted to drop when they were flush with those resources. It basically accounted for everything that the designers improved, um, deemed improved the chances of your survival. The original system that they implemented did not include money in the economy of that, but after testing, the designers realized that the system worked, but worked but that it would lead to players never using the infamous vending machines that later became like a really big deal in those games. So then they added cash into the system of the game and the game dropped, stopped dropping items if the player had a lot of cash, which then forced them to use the vending system instead. Um, talking about difficulty, this entire system was also hooked into the difficulty setting. So if you played this game on easy, which, you know, disputed if that's a good thing, uh, easy would raise the threshold to, so, so, so the game thought players were in need of resources sooner and hard lower the threshold, causing the players to need to maximize even more since resources would be more scarce. I think it was a really elegant way of help of making the system work and including the economy and the vending machines in it. So um, for the time, I think it was a really good solution. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about flow. Um, this is a bit of an odd category, but I really want to go over this because I have a really cool Uncharted series. Um, example in here. So flow and tension are kind of close to one another, so I feel like following up with some techniques on how you can control flow makes sense. Um, flow in games can come obviously in many forms, and I've been trying to find examples that cover a broader broader range here and not just combat things. So some of them marry design with animation techniques, for example, and some are about flow in multiplayer scenarios. So let's talk about Uncharted, because Uncharted is the master of, uh, <laughs> of flow. This is a um, this was brought to me by Kurt Marginal. He's one of the game directors on uh, the Uncharted series, also now on um, on The Last of Us 2. 
but you know, I, I'm an Uncharted person. So <laughs> in the Uncharted series, designers slow down and speed up animations on falling surfaces to give you those like perfectly tense jumps and finishing animations that the, the series is famous for, no matter what your skill level is. So they also help like lining up animations on falling surfaces with following cutscenes. Um, you'll see this in an example in a second. So let's have a look at this, the scene in Uncharted 4. <laughs> I believe, yes, this is four. Um, Uncharted is a very linear, very cinematic experience, as you may know. And many of the interactive scenes have little tricks embedded into them to ensure players actually get to see and experience the action and tension, regardless of player skill. So the underlying principle is similar to previous mechanics where designers are trying to create a moment of feeling like you just made it out by the skin of your teeth, something the Uncharted series is super famous for. OK, so this is a little bit different to explain. I hope this works out. Um, I have two different videos that show the same sequence in the game through uh, a debug um, debug lens. So uh, Nathan, sorry, so he's like climbing up up this, this surface in a second and then you will see a graph show up on the left side that shows the speed of the animation and we can compare the two of them in a second. So I hope this works out. You can see the spline up um, on the falling surface. So as you reach this falling surface, it will fall down and crumble under you. And this spline measures the player's speed as far as you are go, go along with it and then speeds up or slows down the animation accordingly. I hope you can see this. It's a little hard to follow sometimes, but. <laughs> so keep an eye out on the graph that will show up on the left side that measures player's speed. There's the speed. and jump. So it's all very fast. <laughs> but essentially what you're looking at is the player speed was like not always perfect. So it was like kind of fluctuating because this playthrough of this particular sequence was one where the player is not perfect at navigating the system. Now um, I'm showing you the same sequence with a perfect run of the player on the player side where the speed is always up and this, this, you can see that the situation is exactly the same, even though the, the previous player was much less skilled at navigating. So again, keep an eye out on the, on the graph on the left. Speed is always up. <laughs> it's always cool to see debug stuff from, from, uh, from these games, isn't it? So, I'm going to show them side by side and it's not going <laughs> to it's not going to be super um, obvious necessarily because the entire point is that even if you are not playing the sequence of the following surface perfectly, you will have the exact same visual experience than someone who plays it perfectly. There we go. Done. <laughs> so basically what that means is, hold on, sorry, go back. What that means is um, the game accommodates players who might not play the sequence perfectly and still has the same visual experience trying to make you feel like you get away just by the skin of your teeth. So what it happens is the game essentially measures how well the player is doing by tracking their progress along the spline that you see of the falling surface. Um, and predicting that if they move the same average rate for the rest of the sequence, whether they will be early or be late. And the according according to that calculation, the, hold on, sorry, I'm getting there. <laughs> according to that calculation, this backend speeds up or slows down the animation of the falling surface to match up with the following cutscene. So why did Naughty Dog do this? Practically, so there's less work for them to do. <laughs> so it's not only for, for player enjoyment, but also for, uh, helping them make these experiences easier to make. Tuning in animation, so there's one perfect animation speed, takes a really long time, and in the end is less player favoring, because if the player messes up and um, they will hit the fail case more often, and it always sucks to repeat those high, stage, high tension moments. And the other option would be to make the perfect speed just really slow, so most players will get it in time, but the problem with that is you can't have the, oh shit, I just made it situations if you uh, if you design it that way. So a dynamic system that measures player skill along a spine, making it less difficult if you want, <laughs> or you know, favors players in that situation is important. Okay, 
Uh, I think I only have two more examples. Let's talk about SpecOps because SpecOps has so many cool examples. I couldn't, I could barely choose from which one. Um, Jörg Friedrich was the person who gave me these examples. Uh, I do want to talk specifically about grenades and spec ops design because they're so funny and I love the way they are implemented. <laughs> so um, grenades and spec ops are used in two, two different ways. One is to make players feel very skilled with their grenade throws. And the other is to feel like they managed to just catch enemies in it while they try to escape. And uh, another reason for grenades is to help move players along in the in the levels. So the way this works, is as follows. For player grenades that you throw as a player, the mechanic looks a little bit like this. Grenades have an expected point of impact and therefore a death radius. So every enemy caught in that radius, in a death radius, would also be affected by a panic radius, from prompting VO cues to signal to the player that the enemy is affected by their action. So the player throws a grenade, there is a panic radius that affects all enemies within that radius. They will then try to run out of the impact radius, circle, but only far enough to still be hit by the grenades. <laughs> it never happens for enemies to throw to to run out of the circle because that is not the point. The game wants you to hit these enemies with your grenade and make you feel really good for just getting them. So the reasoning behind this mechanic is that the AI needs to give the impression of being smart and believable while still allowing for players to kill them because obviously. <laughs> um, enemies' grenades, however, work as follows. So that's grenades thrown at the player. Enemies and spec ops never actually throw grenades. <laughs> and nobody has really found out until today. <laughs> so if a player wasn't moving for a certain amount of time, uh, a global entity, the grenade director, which is a great name, checked if there was an enemy available who has close enough, uh, who was close enough to the player in an, in an angle that would allow a throw. So then, then there's like a three phase approach. In phase one, the enemy played a voiceover announcing that he would throw a grenade, which is the first warning. So like, grenade, whatever. Phase two, the enemy stepped out of cover and played a throwing grenade animation, which is the second warning. And phase three is a grenade was spawned on a pre-animated curve towards a position very close to the player, trying to get them to move along. Meaning that the enemy never really throws grenades at you. It just fakes the whole thing. <laughs> So the implementation fulfilled the design goal of adding grenades as a threat for players while avoiding the coding of a full ballistic curve feature for enemy AIs. No one ever complained. It totally works. The impression is still the same. And I doubt anyone ha ever realized that the enemies are not actually throwing their grenades. What adds to the illusion is that if you shoot an enemy during phase one or two, when it plays the throw animation, the grenade will spawn right at the enemy position and blow up as if they dropped the grenade where they were about to throw it. <laughs> So, you know, layering these mechanics on top of each other is a good way of, uh, of masking these things. Um, I really want to get through this. So I, I want to show you this last example because it's so funny to me. It is my favorite one of all the ones that I have. <laughs> it, it has its own category because it's so weird and unique that I wanted to make sure that everyone sees it as its own thing. <laughs> Um, this is a very old game. It was given to me by Alex Trowers. He's a game designer on a game called High Octane. This game is now 24 or 25 years old. I can't remember. It's quite special because it's not a deliberate hidden game mechanic, and it has quite a unique story behind it. Um, this is about the Bullfrog game High Octane, a sci-fi racing game in which you can choose between six different vehicles of different shapes and seemingly unique stats. So you can see on screen like velocity, uh, handling, speed, and things like that. Um, however, Alex Trowers, who made this game, <laughs> revealed in his tweets to me that despite displaying different stats for all the vehicles for handling under the hood, all of them were exactly the same. <laughs> so now <laughs> this mechanic wasn't deliberate and ended up in the game due to time constraints under heavy crunch. But it is really notable that for 25 years or so, not a single person playing this game has ever caught on to this lie. <laughs> Um, in fact, many people weighed in saying that they can barely believe that believe that this is actually true because they could swear that different vehicles would handle differently. And it's just, you know, such a beautiful thing to see that it's because of the way the game communicates the different stats and they look different and they all have like extremely different shapes. So our brains just, you know, are so easily fooled into believing these things. And, you know, it sometimes doesn't matter if things are real or if we perceive them as real because... For years, it didn't matter, and people would argue in schoolyards about which fucking <laughs> vehicle was the best in, in high octane. I love this example. 
Anyways, so that's the end of my examples. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about why this is all important. Um, our work is to design for the human mind and the human perception. The human mind is deeply flawed and designing for it means to design with these flaws in mind. At the same time, we are user experience experts, right? Um, that means we design games for users to play and experience and we have a plan in mind for what we intend them to feel. But there are things we can't accurately predict for each and every player who will engage with our work. And we want to allow people to enjoy our work while catering to their needs. So what I'm advocating for is this, no more difficulty modes. So instead of discussing difficulty in terms of hard versus easy, hardcore versus softcore, how about we think about it from an angle of trust and communication instead? When I design for different experiences, I discuss them in terms of gameplay flavors. Even if you belong to one fundamental player type, for example, the wanderer type or you know the hardcore player or whatever it is, we are all combinations of more than one. We all enjoy different aspects of games. Therefore, we, with varying intensity, prefer different gameplay flavors. And just like a good meal, you know, <laughs> none of the real good ones feature only one flavor. A good menu offers many ways to engage with a rich landscape of possibilities and how to approach challenges in the game. So yeah, in conclusion, basically, um, what does it mean for game designers and audiences in the end? To everybody in the room who's more on the gamer side of things, I want to apologize to you for like kind of exposing some of the secrets that we implement into your games. I hope it doesn't make games worse for you. I hope it is coming across that all these things are implemented through love and care. Um, we believe that our players' brains and the mindset of play is more likely to overlook these little lies to make themselves feel more good and positive things. Tension, engagement, empowerment, and even relaxation. Embracing that is a good thing. We want to ensure they know that what, what game designers craft the experience for them, we do so because we care about them more than anything else in our jobs. We make games for people. And that is what we what we do, right? The very essence of our job is to bring things to players that they didn't know they wanted and they didn't know they wanted to expect. And that is why we all have probably fallen in love with making games in the first place. So I'm going to leave you with one last quote and then we can do some questions. The magician takes the ordinary something and makes it do something extraordinary. Now you're looking for the secret, but you won't find it because, of course, you're not really looking. You don't really want to know. You want to be fooled. Thank you, everyone. Hey. <laughs> Okay, uh, I don't know how this works now. Are we doing Q and A? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, Jenny, you can put, you can stop sharing your screen so everyone can see your face. Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, please put your questions in the Q and A. Uh, and just before we, before we start, uh, this is a form that we always share. Please fill up the survey at the end of this talk. It gives us great data and helps us make good talks for you. Um, so, Jenny, what I'll do is there are a bunch of questions coming in. I'll just start pushing them onto your okay. screen. So, okay. just try this one. This is the first one by Eugene. Where could I go to learn screen? more about hidden game design? Any books to recommend? Maybe forums or Discord groups? <laughs> Thanks, Eugene. Um, no, <laughs> there is nothing. It's so sad, really, because when I started um, arguing that hidden game design is a thing, there was just nothing. You know, I, I started this entire topic because I wanted to argue that this is, this is a thing in the first place. And like we never had these discussions before. So I'm currently writing my own book about this because it doesn't exist. <laughs> um, so there is no such thing. I, I kind of started the whole thing with the hidden game design a couple of years back. But you can look into, uh, into UX books that sometimes go a little bit into that direction. So I recommend Celia Howden's book. Um, she has a couple of books about the, the player's mind and how brains work and things like that. It's a very good book. Um, I can put it in the chat. I don't know if that makes sense. I'm putting it, uh, her name in the uh, in the public audience chat. Her name is Celia Hodent. Uh, she's awesome. I recommend everything she writes. <laughs> um, your re recent Sekiro difficulty measuring system, like how and why it stands out for its difficulty. Uh, I think the Sekiro system is similar to to the Dark Souls formula that I went over earlier in the talk. Um, to me, they are more or less interchangeable. It's trying to implement a progression system instead of a difficulty curve. Like I, I like to think about it as a progression system instead of difficulty because it's just less culturally acceptable to learn while you're doing and to learn while you're in like a, a scary, difficult, anxiety-inducing situation. That is why we perceive Sekiro 
Dark Souls, all these games as more difficult, anxiety-inducing, scary, because it requires us to fail while we play. <laughs> Does it answer your question? I hope. Um, as an indie developer, it would be tough to create long open worlds, so if we be practical and keep it as a short five to six hour gameplay, should we be more intense difficulty to pack a punch? Um, I, I wouldn't think about it this way. Try to think about it more from a perspective of what kind of experience are you trying to deliver? What suits your game? I, I don't think it should be tied to how long the game is. So Hellblade, for example, the game that I spoke about earlier in the in the presentation, is a six to 10 hour game, depending on how you play. Um, and it is, it really was very deliberate about how it tried to deliver its experience, right? So part of the the vision for the game was to make it looked like Senua's struggles. So it was one of the pillars of the game, if you want, um, that would go through all aspects of the way the game was designed. And it was a very short game, and it didn't compromise on that. So try to find what suits your game and what suits your vision instead. And don't make it about how long the game is. It doesn't really matter. Try to think about what you want the player to experience. Try to make mechanics and find good systems that support the emotional impact you want to have on the player. It's always good to think about that through that lens instead of difficulty, if you want. And you know, Celeste is also a short game. Undefined as by, I couldn't see that question. It says undefined. Um, oh, so this one came from uh, Tejas. All the examples you've given work in single player games. What different considerations and or approaches would you have on multiplayer? Uh, yeah, I cut some of the multiplayer examples out of this talk because I didn't have enough time. Uh, but multiplayer games have these mechanics too. So for example, Gears of War, um, its multiplayer mode has a hidden game mechanic where if you play the multiplayer mode for the first time and you haven't played, uh, the, the system knows that you haven't played the multiplayer mode before, it gives the damage bonus that you get from the um, the minigame, the reload minigame, permanently to people. So, in sorry, if you don't know from Gears of War, Gears of War has a reload mechanic where when you reload, there's this like, tiny little bar that um, that fills up and you need to like hit the reload button at a certain amount of time to get a, a reload damage bonus. So Gears of War in a multiplayer setting gives every new player until they have the first couple of kills that damage bonus automatically without having to complete the... Um, the reload mechanic to help them learn the game and learn how to play multiplayer games. <clears throat> it actually is quite common in multiplayer games to give newcomers a couple of hidden game mechanics to help them out because most multiplayer players, when they play for the first time, quit the game if they don't win their first match. <laughs> it's a thing. Like humans are weird <clears throat> and humans believe that they are not good at something as soon as they lose the first match. So a lot of games help new gamers out when they try their first multiplayer match for the first time. Uh, Spellbreak does that. It makes you play against bots that are fairly easy. And then you play with real people. And it's a whole thing. So, you know, multiplayer games do this too. And it's very important to do this to help build healthy multiplayer communi communities. Because if your players leave after the first match because they didn't win, and they don't even, like, try to go on further, then it's, imp it's impossible to build a good multiplayer community. So sometimes you have to support new players to like be part of the multiplayer pool in the first place. So this exists in multiplayer games just as much. Same thing. I can't see this question. <laughs> Sorry. Undefined. Well, no, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. It's it's my bad. It's a bug. I think. What do you think about ludo narrative dissonance that is talked about in Bioshock and Uncharted? <laughs> so it's a question about ludo Evil narrative word. dissonance, and I think a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> Ludo narrative dissonance is uh, it's funny because it's it's among some game designers it's like the evil word. <laughs> um, I think I think it's like beating a dead horse a little bit. <laughs> you know, I, I know we talk a lot about ludonarrative narrative dissonance. You know, the idea that sometimes we we deal uh, with the perceived personality of uh, of like let's say a good character and then we play this character and that character murders like hundreds of, of enemies right like how do we how do we make that line up <laughs> that is literally narrative dissonance um i personally think it doesn't matter too much i, I i'm not as hung up about literally narrative dissonance as other people because everyone knows it's a game right so in the end uh we have to forego some of those like real world 
rules to make an experience engaging. Yeah, sure. I am Nathan Drake. I'm supposed to be the good guy and I'm murdering millions of enemies. That doesn't really track with being the good guy, right? But in the end, it's still just a game. In the end, you're you're suspending reality in so many different ways already. Um, I think it's more important to have emotional impact than to try and like cater to these real world problems that we perceive. That's my personal opinion. Um, I think we have time for about one more question. Um, folks, if any of you have something really meaningful and important you'd like to ask Jennifer here, this is the time to put it in. I'm just going to quickly go through the list that we have. And um, all right, there's there's a rather nice looking one over. Okay, you know, I think this is a good question. Let's, let's do this. I can't see it. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Uh, this is thank you for this. That's a good flag. How much of game design is intentional? And how much is just something which emerges out of flexible design? Uh, I guess it's something that was not actually intended by the designer. This was asked by Dave. I love that question. We are asked <laughs> I love that question. Thank you. That's awesome. <clears throat> uh, so, oh God, it's like almost a philosophy question. <laughs> I think, I think a lot of game design is um, is instinct. You know, the the best game designers I've ever worked with and I've ever met have good instincts and in how they design. You know, there's, there's people who are like walking in encyclopedias about what other games do and how other games design things. But I think the best game designers out there are people who have a good gut feeling about how things work and why we implement them that way. And who are willing to follow uh, instincts and like new leads as they emerge when you design. <clears throat> because usually, you know, things are so fluid when you design games and they change as soon as you put them in front of other people and as soon as you put them into players' hands. So needing to stay humble and fluid in your design, I think is a really good skill to learn. But in the end, um, even if you stay fluid, everything is still intentional. You know, you might not have it all figured out at the beginning, but, uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about game designers doing the door problem. If you've ever heard of that before, the door problem is this explanation of what game design is, right? It's this whole thing of, oh, all the questions that game designers need to ask when they make a game related to a door. Does my game have doors? How many doors are there? Can you open the door? Do you need keys for the door? Do you need key cards? Can everyone open the door? Can enemies open the door? How big are the doors? You know, like things like that. You know, we're, we're creating these worlds out of thin air. So we have to make intentional decisions on millions of things while we make games. So I think... I think everything in the end is intentional, but staying fluid in how you think about design and how you you hone your instincts is really important when you design. I don't know if this answers your question. I hope it does. I believe intention is what should be the end goal of what you do, but staying fluid in how you think about ideas as they come up is an important instinct of any game, game designer. Not that it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think with that, we are at time. Uh, Jenny, Jennifer, thank you so very much for taking the time out to be here for this. Thank you. I think, uh, <laughs> I think the, the large, the barrage of likes that is coming through is the thank virtual you. applause. <laughs> so we're so grateful you could make it. And yeah, as the comments are going, we hope that someday when the world returns to normal, we can actually have. Oh my God, there. I would love to. Um, <laughs> Please take me out of here. <laughs> the, food is, the, food is, the food is amazing. <laughs> uh, and I think she's very welcoming. All right, folks. Um, I guess that's the end of the design track for the day. Jenny, if any words of wisdom you'd like to leave us with for all the budding game designers here? Lots of indies in the Just crowd. Just keep making games. <laughs> Just keep making games. All and right. I really Fantastic. hope that I get to meet you all in person at some point when all of this is over. <laughs> Super. We hope so too. All right, then, uh, folks, have a good night, everyone. We'll see you all tomorrow for the next set of talks. Uh, we're going to be featuring a great panel on roguelike design tomorrow evening with Amir Rao, who made Hades, and Anthony, who made State Spy, and Rami Ismail, who made Nuclear Throne. So please be there for that. Uh, Jenny, we'll catch you backstage. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Nice to meet you. <laughs>